Fcat is tasked with looking at emerging and horizon technologies, which we usually think of as being at least three to five years away. And our goal here is to figure out how these technologies are going to impact our company and our customers, really across the board. It's pretty, a, a pretty wide mandate. Um, we have a really hands-on approach. So, and this is really in the philosophy of FCAT. We test things, we build things, we break things, we scale things. And we do this all to figure out really when these technologies should be used. That's our goal here. Um, and I say technologies because, of course, quantum does fit squarely in that at least three to five years away type of range. But there's phenomenal work happening in other areas, too. We've got a team looking at AI, a team looking at blockchain, um, immersive tech and interfaces. Uh, and in addition to the technology, we also look at things like the social and ethical impacts of these technologies. It really is a quite, a, quite a comprehensive approach. Now, getting back to quantum, um, I did say we're interested in when we should use these technologies. And our approach here we think of as technology first with use cases in mind. So what we don't typically do is come with a full use case and say, what can we do with this? And the reason we don't do this is because we find that the results are often let's say, suboptimal. And they can also, you can also lead to a bit of tunnel vision, right? You miss opportunities along the way. Uh, and it was with that type of attitude that I think we entered this project here. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to be saying some things here to a crowd that knows us well. When you look at quantum applications, especially ones that offer the promise, advantage, or speed ups, there are some significant gaps in the end-to-end -end implementation of these applications. Uh, one of the big gaps, in many cases, is efficient state preparation or data loading. I guess these are not quite equivalent, but they're obviously related. Uh, so, for example, in Quantum Monte Carlo, we have a promised quadratic speedup. But if you can't get data in and out of that application efficiently, you could completely nullify the advantage that it's promising to give you. <laughs> Similarly, if we can't get data into QML uh, processes properly, you could, again, kind of miss the advantage there. And thinking about what kind of data loading, what kind of, uh, what kind of distributions we'd want to put into these types of processes, this is where the with use cases in mind aspect comes into play. It was quickly, quickly obvious to us that we care a lot about normal distributions, right? In finance, these are ubiquitous. They're used for stock pricing. They're used for planning around market events. And there aren't many NISC-friendly algorithms around to help us do this. Uh, other ones that we saw, some could really introduce a massive overhead some required mid-circuit mid mid measurements, which we just heard a little bit about yesterday. They're not always available. When they are, they can introduce failures. And so we wanted to come together with IronQ to try to create or, and implement a reliable, efficient, and um, scalable process to prepare states that could encode these distributions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nicole to talk about what we actually did. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, a warm welcome to all of you from IonQ. Uh, you may know that we build quantum computers from atoms, ionized atoms, but we're also focused on real-world applications, exemplified by this collaboration with the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. My name is Nicole Barbaris. I'm the technical director on the go-to-market team. Before joining IonQ, I worked on, uh, at IBM Quantum as a machine learning developer. So everything I share with you today is from a developer's perspective. So today's session is about this paper that was published recently in March by our colleagues uh, Elton Ju from the Fidelity Center for Advanced uh, Applied Technology, and then my colleagues Sonica Jowry and Jason Iaconis. The paper centers around uh, how to load data, real-world data, onto a quantum circuit. And this is uh, particularly important because, like Mike was saying, this has been a challenge in our field for a while. Because you don't want that task, right, loading the data to overwhelm the benefits that you're expecting from the quantum algorithm. Furthermore, this is news to you because, or news to us, right, the results of this paper, because it paves the way for much more complex end-to-end uh, -end applications, in particular, for example, Monte Carlo, right? Uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Now, to uh, give you a little bit of context here, I think the, the yeah, let's, let's start here. So the focus of this research is on a normal distribution, so data sampled from normal distributions, but it generalizes to any smooth differentiable distribution, such as log normal, uniform, uh, 
much of the data that are prepared for input into a Monte Carlo process come from these smooth and differentiable distributions. The paper focuses on a univariate normal distribution, but uh, we expect it to generalize pretty well to multivariate regions, right, where you need to sample from uh, more complex regions. Now, to put this research in context for you, I'd like to, you, to, you to focus on the bottom, on the flow. This represents a general quantum application flow. It's hybrid, right? So the blue steps are classical pre-processing and um, also at the end, some post-processing. And in the middle, those red boxes represent the part of the algorithm, um, the part of the application that is processed on a quantum computer. Notice box number two and three. This is where these results are applicable. Box number two, we take the real world data, transform it through a series of steps into matrix product states. These are just special matrices that represent the data. From there, we can take that representation and create quantum circuits. The, the value of this work to you is that the paper also shows the efficiency and the accuracy of this process, which we'll get into. And we talked about that. So uh, to give a, a little bit of context for those of you new to quantum computing, in particular new to uh, ion Q, the, the quality of the qubits really matter in this context, which uh, results in the low errors in the, in the results that we have out of the paper. So a little bit of context here, right? A quantum computer is a device making use of these quantum effects that are unique to a quantum computer. They don't exist on a conventional computer. And this algorithm also makes use of superposition, entanglement, and interference. And these operations are performed on qubits. Now, the, to give you an idea of why this really matters, right? if you have 25 qubits, you have around 33 million usable computational states. So if the qubits have low error, right, you have available to you more of these states. And look what happens with more qubits you add. You see that exponential growth in the computational space. This is, of course, why we're all excited about quantum computers. right? This is the heart of the issue of why we're interested in quantum computers. And uh, what I want you to take away from this slide is that the quality of the qubits matters. Now, I go back to, I think this, here we go. So how you build qubits also, right, there are, there are many ways to build qubits. On uh, the left, right, there'll be, no, on my right, you see, uh, uh, you know, IBM and Google working on superconducting qubits. This is dramatically different than the qubits we're using at IonQ. We are, we're using atoms, ionized atoms, and this particular phase are ethereum atoms. And what's important, especially for this use case, these are perfectly quantum objects, right? They want to remain quantum. They're not individually engineered. So from a developer's perspective, you're not having to account for the additional errors that are introduced in the manufacturing process, right? Our, perfect, our qubits are perfectly identical, and we do not need dilution refrigeration. This means that uh, we're able to scale, have the, uh, create modular systems, and in fact, we just opened an office in Bothell near Seattle where we will start manufacturing these rack-mounted quantum computers. Very exciting. But what I want you to take away from this is that the quality and the manufacturing of the qubits really matter at the application level. Now, two more things I want you to take away uh, related to this work is that the um, long qubit lifetimes. Given that we're using naturally quantum objects, we have very long coherence times relative to other modalities. This is important from an application perspective because it means that you can run a longer program, right? Literally, more Qiskit code that you can run and execute on an ion Q um, trapped ion system. Another important point is the high gate fidelities. This is related to executing uh, those operations on the computer. All right, now, I'm showing this again because I want to remind you of this context, in particular, 
uh, point to the Monte Carlo methods. You may be aware that Monte Carlos are used when you cannot calculate a quantity directly. Either it just takes too long or it's analytically very complex, and so we do Monte Carlo sampling. Often this is uh, on multivariate data. So although this re these research results are dealing with a univariate normal distribution, they easily generalize to more complex uh, multivariate regions that you need to sample from. This is something we would love to collaborate with you on, right, and extend this work further, either with your uh, more complex real-world data sets, multivariate data sets. There, there's a great opportunity here to extend this work with your uh, use cases. So, and just as a reminder, we're talking about those two new boxes there in the pre-processing. All right, so how does this algorithm work? In uh, Monte Carlo processes, the input data are generally these smooth differentiable distributions. Now, like I mentioned, the paper chose the normal distribution for, for very good uh, research reasons. One, it's useful, right? So it would uh, have useful results immediately, even though it's just a univariate, you know, one, um, one time series, a set of data from just uh, one normal distribution. But it also allowed the team to do error analysis. This is very important to you because you want, and as a developer, right, you, you need to know, you need to have a guarantee that the data you load onto the quantum circuit is going to remain the data that you're expecting, right, before you implement your quantum algorithm. On a quantum system, you can't check that directly, right? You have to load your data, run the algorithm, and measure at the end. So in this paper, they have, uh, they give you the evidence to show, and, and I, I have a slide on that, I'll show you, that the input data that you've loaded from your laptop, from your database, is actually the same distribution that the quantum algorithm is now going to process. So on, the, uh, on my right, actually on my left, just some examples of the type of, you know, it doesn't matter. These are families of normal distribution, not just one particular mean or variance uh, described in the distribution. So the first step is just to get your, your, your data, get it ready on your laptop. And now we're going to talk about a series of transformations. So the first transformation is to take that smooth differentiable distribution and turn it into a discrete distribution. For the normal distribution, this happens to be something called an Irwin Hall. But you can imagine there are many ways, if you have a, if you have a Poisson distribution or a log normal or a uniform, there will be other methods to use to discretize that. Once you, you've discretized the distribution, step number two, you can turn those into matrix product states. These are special matrices described by tensors, right? And that matrix, of course, can now be turned into a gate, right? Can turn, be turned into a circuit, and we have very efficient ways to do this. So I want to focus your attention on uh, the, well, transformation number three, exemplified by A. Let's start there. So transformation number three, there, did, uh, there exists already methods for doing this. So the ingenuity and the creativity of the team, the Fidelity team and the IonQ team, is to kind of bring all these methods together and create a very streamlined way for you to load your data on a quantum circuit. So focusing on A, those black dots are qubits, and each of those blue bars are a set of quantum computing gates. And you can see number C. It starts out with some phase gates. You have a rotation around the y-axis on the second qubit, some C naught gates. So just a series of operations that represent that blue um, chunk of code. And then every two qubits, you execute that unitary block of code. Notice that we're measuring all the qubits. So the output of this circuit is a classical object, right? A vector of zeros and ones. That will be transformed into a real number. That's the post-processing, the classical post-processing at the end. So you go from real numbers on your laptop, transform it into a discrete distribution, the matrix product state, 
load it onto the quantum circuit, run the algorithm that you want. In this case, we're talking about Monte Carlo. It could be a quantum machine learning, a generative adversarial network, other generative uh, frameworks. At the very end, you get this bit string, which you then transform back into a real value. Now, the circuit A, that's the building block. The efficiency that I want to point out to you is that as you increase the qubit, so as your, let's call it the Y axis, right, um, vertically, as you increase qubits, you don't need to extend the circuit depth. What that means is that more qubits represent more samples from your original distribution, right? So you have, you, you get better and better resolution with more qubits, but you don't need to extend the circuit depth. Now, example B has, has more to do with these matrix product states. They happen to be ideal ways of representing real data when your input data has very low entanglement. If you examine your data and see that there's more, you need a, a matrix product state with a bond greater than two, this is a lot of lingo for those of you familiar with, with matrix product states, but the, the takeaway here is that if, if there's more entanglement in your original data, right, and you suspect there's more correlations, right? Entanglement is a, a, generaliza a generalization of correlation. So you can intuitive, intuitively look at it that way. If there's a lot more correlation in your real world data, you might need a bond uh, length greater than two. In that case, you just repeat the circuit. And uh, this was, these circuits were executed on real quantum computers, right, using 20 qubits. But what I want you to take away from this slide is the efficiency of the approach, right? The more data you have, the circuit depth does not increase for a generally good representation of the original. All right. And finally, the accuracy of the, this is very important too. I, as a developer, want to know that what I loaded onto the quantum circuit remains the data that I wanted to load on the circuit. On the graph in A, A, B, and C represent different designs. N is the number of qubits, little n is the bond length, and D is the depth of the circuit. And look at A, even though you have a depth of circuit, just one, so that means you're just using this one chain uh, represented in A, you're getting a very good match. The ideal is the uh, results from an analytical probability uh, density function, right, a PDF. So that's the, the mathematical ideal compared to the clean, which represents the ideal simulator result, a noisy simulator result. And then the orange is from a real quantum uh, computer, ion Q in this case. So with a, with a very short circuit depth, you can represent your original data very well. And then as you either increase the depth or increase the bond length on current NISC systems with the noise that exists in our current system, you see the, the fit um, starts to deviate. The fit was measured with uh, the Kolmogorov Smirnov, you know, goodness of fit metric. All right. And so with that, uh, you know, just in conclusion, this paper shows you how to load data onto a quantum computer efficiently and accurately. And we expect this to pave the way for many, many exciting collaborations across the quantum industry.